everybody. Uh, thanks for being here. It's a pleasure to be on stage. And um, we are going to go through a thousand years of past, presents, and futures in only 25 minutes. So I'm afraid I'm going to have to go quite quickly. So uh, yeah, just a little bit about what I, who I am and what I do. I'm a technology editor at the MIT Computational Law Report, which is a journal based at the MIT Media Lab. And uh, there, I, edit, uh, I, I write a column on um, misadventures in crypto governance, which is where the uh, title of this talk has come from. And on the screen, you can see a sneak peek of the next column, which covers the years 2014 to 2019 in the blockchain space, which I like to think of as the dark ages of blockchain governance. And on the right of the slide, you can see there's a little meme with uh, Pepe on it. And I know we're in the West, and Pepe is a somewhat maligned character in these lands. Uh, but in different parts of the world, Pepe takes on some different connotations and invocations. So I implore you at this early stage of the presentation to decolonize your notions of Pepe. And with that said, we will carry on. So one of the things I did before was I um, uh, co-founded and operated for several years MIT's blockchain journal, which is called Crypto Economic Systems. And that was an explicitly interdisciplinary endeavor where we were trying to build a big tent for this new field that we're here today to explore and research, uh, bringing together people from disparate fields and disciplines, everything from mathematics and cryptography to sociology, politic, politics, governance, anthropology, economics, game theory, and so on. And so I learned a little bit about uh, how to bridge gaps between disciplines, acting as an epistemic emissary between uh, people with different languages, different formalisms, and different codes. And so here's a slide I used to show in my uh, journal days, which I thought I would resurrect uh, for today on the meme. It's about how hard communication is, even at the best of times. And so the meme says, a baklava, a baklava wearing a balaclava while playing balalaika on black lava. Try saying that quickly. And it shows you that we can use, have these words that sound the same that mean different things. And you know, the contrary is also true. We can have words that sound uh, similar but mean very different things. And so communication is hard, and that's the bedrock of everything that we attempt to do as humans. So with that said, let's move on. Um, I want to say something just really quick about markets. So we live in a society, and markets rule almost everything around us. I'm sure you've noticed that by now. Um, so let's say a little bit about that. Here's a meme. Financial growth. Exponential financial growth. Exponential financial growth on a planet with finite resources. And the bottom corner, you've got the universal paperclips game. So I see capitalism, the market-based modern variants of capitalism, as the universal paperclips game writ large. So capitalism is optimizing to extract, to exploit, to commoditize, to assetize. And it seems to be able to touch almost everything around us. And I think that's especially relevant for us today. Uh, we're here at Protocol Berg. We're talking about decentralized networks. And at the core of almost all of them are speculative objects. Let's be real about that. So I like to invoke some of the work of uh, Jean Baudrillard. And you may be familiar with his writing on simulacra and so on uh, directly. Or you may be indirectly familiar with it through films like The Matrix. Um, but I think that uh, his later work in Symbolic Exchange and Death is particularly relevant and interesting for what we see in the blockchain space today. And I'm going to read you a little bit of a quote from this. We now live in a world dominated by the free play of the monetary sign that's beyond reference to any reel of production or even a monetary referent in the form of a gold standard. In this world, the idea of a real value of equities, of commodities, of houses, of anything is meaningless as what matters Instead, it's not value per se, but infinite speculation. This new world is marked by the emergence of a brothel of capital, not for prostitution, but for substitution and commutation. And so Baudrillard invoked a three-stage taxonomy of different forms of value as they're reified, refined, and corrupted by capitalism. We start with simple commodity resources um, that get acted upon by labor, to become refined commodity forms that have social value. And today, I would argue, as Baudrillard set it out decades ago, that what we see now are symbolic forms of value, post-social monetary signs, meme economies. Let's talk a bit about DAOs. And I know that 
we all know about the DAO, and we all know about what happened in 2016 with Ethereum and the split with Ethereum Classic. I don't want to litigate that too much. I've actually got some other examples that we talk about much less, which I think are more interesting for us to explore. Uh, but first, I wanted to say something about this concept of the cathedral and the bazaar that came from Eric Raymond, who was a pr prominent uh, uh, open source developer in the Linux world. Um, so the idea of the cathedral is this centralized hierarchical domain of um, explicit power structures. Um, and the, the counterpoint to that is the bazaar, the P2P, Agora. And like Raymond's um, conception of all of this, this is all pre, very much pre-blockchain. It's quite basic, it's quite simplistic, it's quite black and white. Cathedral bad, bazaar good. But I might say, what about in the bazaar we might see um, uh, tensions around the price of anarchy, tragedies of the commons, cathedrals within the bazaars, insider asymmetries in these networks, co-option, capture, and the tyranny of structurelessness. Uh, we don't have that much time today, so I'm not going to go into all of these concepts, uh, but I do want to pick on the price of anarchy, which I think is extremely relevant for uh, protocol networks like the ones we're talking about today. So the price of anarchy compares differences in efficiency in the presence and absence of hierarchical coordination mechanisms in particular scenarios. And it was initially invoked with reference to uh, packets being routed around digital networks, much like the blockchain networks we have today. Um, but it, the price of anarchy as a concept is very useful uh, as we, if we invoke it in all contexts, from solidarity-based organizations all the way through to uh, digital networks. Code is law. So this was a concept from the 90s. And we've heard these words espoused in the blockchain space, not so much now, but more in the past. Um, initially uh, framed by uh, Bill Mitchell in City of Bits, and shortly afterwards by Larry Lessig. Uh, Larry usually gets the credit for this, so I think it's nice that we mention Bill Mitchell as well. Sorry, Larry. Um, and uh, Lessig's conception of this was a form of regulation where private actors may embed their values into technological artifacts. Now, just as we might say that Marx failed to consider Homo economicus, we might also say that Lessig failed to consider homo blockonomicus. That's a bad joke. OK, so I said I wasn't going to talk about the DAO. I lied. Um, it, there's a little bit of the DAO here. And you know there was a great deal of promise uh, with the DAO. I was not that interested in Ethereum when it came about. I was already quite active in the space by then. Uh, but when the DAO was announced, then I started to get interesting, uh, interested. This was a way to make these ideas real and operate, uh, operationalize them at scale. And, it's, much ink has been spilled about what happened with the DAO, so I don't want to get too much into that. There's a nice meme on the right, which I think explains almost everything we need to know today. Um, and there was a fork, and you know, one side of the uh, community split thought that code was law, that um, we shouldn't change the rules, we shouldn't revise history, we should instead live with the consequences of the way the uh, networks were encoded at their birth. But I will just say that you know, I was having a conversation with a law professor last weekend, and we were in the process of that conversation. We, we thought to ourselves, well, the law changes, right? Laws of nations and men and stuff, they do change, because the, the world changes, society changes, technology changes, paradigms change. So the idea of code is law is a weird inversion of the very notion of law in, its, in itself. Anyway, I spent a fair bit of time researching the Ethereum Classic community in the post-fork. Uh, fallout. I ended up speaking at their conferences. You can watch videos of me online in Korea, sitting alongside people like Virgil Griffith, discussing things like censorship resistance and immutability. And I was really interested in this nascent little community that was trying to um, enact these ideas and hold on to these concepts as, uh, as uh, time went on. And um, Ethereum Classic isn't really anywhere anymore. There isn't really a community around that network. Um, and so it became less interesting as a subject of research. But this is the kind of thing that Bitcoiners say about Ethereum. So I don't know if you've seen this meme. It's one of my favorites. It's not very charitable. Um, so here's Vitalik. Um, and he is explaining to the Pacific Islanders of Yap, who have this primitive monetary system called Rye Stones. He's explaining to them how you can delay, uh, perform irregular state transitions uh, in the Ethereum network. And so this is what the Bitcoiners think of the Ethereum DAO debacle. So. Anyway, things change, narratives change, uh, networks change. Uh, this is a bit of older work by some uh, researchers mapping uh, evolutions of the narratives around the Ethereum network over time. I'd be very interested if anybody knows if this work has been updated or somebody's done something equivalent uh, to that. Um, and now, I want to talk a little bit about 
uh, the ghosts of governance past. So we're going to go even further back than Ethereum. We are going to talk about Dash. So Dash was a Bitcoin-like monetary cryptocurrency, uh, which had this um, innovation, you could say, of masternodes. And masternodes are a little bit like the staking nodes in Ethereum that we have today. The idea being that you would take a 1,000 of your Dash coins, you would lock them up on your node, render them liquid, and then you would have a masternode. And the masternode would perform various functions in the network, such as coin mixing, in return for rewards. Uh, but also, more relevant for, for this talk, uh, you would then get one, one masternode would get one vote in the Dash DAO. And a portion of the block rewards from the proof of work of Dash would go in this treasury. And then people would, it was like a fairly standard proto DAO proposal system. People would propose uh, projects to get funded, and then they would get voted on by the community, and then they would either get funded or they wouldn't. So I was at a Bitcoin conference in 2018, and I met a Dash core developer smoking a cigarette outside the hackathon, where I was trying to build humanitarian, pro prototype humanitarian applications for Bitcoin. And I don't think, I'm not doing that anymore. I don't think there's much point in doing that anymore. But uh, all that to say is that um, I mentioned to this developer that I was researching the governance asymmetries in minority cryptocurrency networks, and he immediately proceeded to trauma dump on me uh, without being, I didn't ask. Um, and so what he said to me was, help me, there's a problem in our network, it's falling apart. Um, there, there are all of these overpriced, poor quality proposals in the Dash DAO, they're getting funded and all of the good ones are getting rejected. And so we looked into this a little bit, and what we realized we were seeing was a cartel slowly taking over control of the, uh, the governance functions of the network. And so <clears throat> one thing that's really interesting and important to note about Dash is when you do a proof of work network, you announce it, like we'd use a Bitcoin talk forum to announce these things, and that would be so that a lot of people would know about it, a lot of people would be pointing their CPUs, GPUs at the network at the start to get a fair launch so that the coins would get distributed and you would form a genuine community. Now, uh, Dash uh, had this feature called an Instamine, where the difficulty of the mining was set anomalously low. It was very easy to find blocks and get the block rewards at the start of the network. And as a result, uh, you would argue that the insiders, the people that knew about the network at the launch of it, made out like bandits, got loads of the coins, therefore had uh, the capabilities to set up lots of the masternodes therefore had lots of votes in the Dash DAO, and therefore could begin to exert control over the governance functions of the treasury. So here's a meme. Um, so yeah, we saw this Instamine, and they could have restarted the network. They could have done a fair launch. They could have started again. Do a mulligan, they did not. Um, and so with this situation, the insiders controlled an outsized portion of the token supply and became a cartel. We were literally the, watched the, frog water, the frogs boiling in the waters of centralization. The overpriced proposals fe fe uh, succeeded, the good ones failed, and the, ca the cartel just slowly cemented control over the network. And it's just uh, interesting to note that Dash is no longer one of the major cryptocurrencies, and this may be one of the reasons why. So here's an excerpt from a book that I was trying to write about this several years ago, which I think explains why I saw happening uh, at that time. There may exist a series of shadow power structures allowing powerful ins insiders to exercise clandestine influence over the path that a network may take through manipulation of in-protocol and or extra-protocol governance mechanisms. The analysis of Dash explores, amongst other phenomena, the emergence of a social civil asymmetric governance vector, whereby striated cadres of network insiders, developers, marketeers, miners, and so on, gradually consolidate effective power and influence by arbitraging governance mechanisms, leveraging the intimate knowledge of their function. So uh, we've seen many networks that have delegated systems, DPoS type systems. You can think of BitShares, you can think of Steam, you can think of EOS, and these networks all seem to have gone the, the same way as Dash. I really enjoy this meme on the bottom left. It's by Tim Pastor, uh, 2015, um, with the monopoly man controlling most of the network archit architectures and power uh, uh, structures. And when it came out that EOS was being cartelized as well, uh, many of the researchers in the space were not very surprised. And here's some memes that I was making at the time, comparing the EOS cartel to the De Beers diamond cartel, which is <laughs> quite, a, quite a cartel. Anyway, uh, let's talk about the present. So uh, sleepwalking into oblivion. Um, I would do quite a lot of research into a proof of work cryptocurrency called Bitcoin. You might have heard of it. And uh, I think of Bitcoin as an inhuman monetary system where fractals don't care about your feelings, systems disregard their externalities, and formalisms can't 
uh, cannot reason about the real. And because of the way that Bitcoin works, it only has a single kind of uh, feedback mechanism that adjusts the probability of a cycle of computation of the proof of work of finding a block. And it does that to keep the regularity of the blocks on target. So the clock of Bitcoin keeps ticking. But th for this reason, Bitcoin has no satiety. It will never have enough energy. And it turns out we live on a planet. We get most of our energy from the sun. So we live in a domain of energy scarcity. And if Bitcoin wants it all, and we need some, you can see why there might be a problem there. So uh, last year, the European Commission uh, gave our collective, Zero Exelon, some funding to do uh, a series of projects, art projects, uh, probing the ecological externalities and implications of proof of work. We made a theater production called The Black Hole of Money, and we made a computer game called The Immaculate Misconception, which you can play right now uh, at virtual.hek.ch. It's in an uh, online exhibition at the Haus der Elektronisches Kunst in Basel. And a key character in the play in the game is a little thing called Hashi. Well, we all remember Clippy, the anthropomorphized, annoying Microsoft Office paperclip. But what about an anthropomorphized Bitcoin ASIC called Hashi? Well, imagine the future where the planet is degrading and uh, the miners, the thermocapitalist cartel, need to gaslight and uh, manipulate public opinion to make it palatable to keep the mining going. They might invent a cute virtual influencer, a little avatar to manipulate and greenwash everything. So you watch out for Hashi. It's from the future, so you're going to see it more and as time goes on. And uh, that's my journey. So I came into Bitcoin 2013, and I loved it. Um, I'm from a diaspora background. My parents are from Iraq. So I saw it as a way that we could engage in humanitarian libertari uh, liberatory praxis, and I don't see that anymore. The costs of running the Bitcoin network far outweigh the benefits as time has gone on. Just like with Ethereum, the narratives around Bitcoin have also evolved, and I won't go into them now, but there are many different ways that these have evolved from mutualistic ones to zero-sum and capitalistic ones. As I said, we live in a domain of scarcity. Uh, uh, communication networks are constrained by the speed of light, so we can't really push this thing too far away from Earth, so we seem to be stuck here with it. And that, what, I see one of two end games possible here. One is that Bitcoin provides the incentives for uh, uh, a post-scarcity future to develop you know, abundant energy where the Bitcoiners will have everything and we'll be living on scraps. That's the good one. Uh, the bad one is that we continue to be locked into a zero-sum game where machines become the direct antagonists of nature. So, yeah, minor oligarchy, developer cathedral, escargot cult, immutable white paperism, and necroprimitivism. In the interest of time, I won't go into this too much, but an article just dropped called Necroprimitivism Rising, where I characterize the social cult of Bitcoin as I see it. You're very welcome to read it. Uh, we'll skip a little bit of this, and let's talk about petromasculinity. I think this is a very useful concept for proof of work. Uh, this is a quote from Kara Daggett. As the planet warms, new authoritarian movements in the West are embracing a toxic combination of climate denial, racism, and misogyny. Petromasculinity appreciates the historic role of fossil fuel systems in buttressing white patriarchal rule as anxieties aroused by the Anthropocene augment desires for authoritarianism. Petromasculinity suggests that fossil fuels mean more than profit. They contribute to making identities. Through a psychopolitical reading of authoritarianism, fossil fuel can function as a violent reactionary practice. Well, that sounds very nice, doesn't it? I'm going to skip some of these examples. and We'll move on to the uh, profits. The profits that will lead us to the promised lands, and the new horizons, the new frontiers, the new colonialisms that we see emerging before us. And like, normally I kind of rail on the masculine subject here, but like, it's not always men. So like, you know, we're getting kind of like empowered here. Like we can have some gender representation. Uh, one Coin and One Life was led by a, a Bulgarian woman, Ruja Ignatova, who is, I think, one of the most wanted people on the planet. So if you know where she is, uh, let the FBI know. Uh, this is a, a quote from the introduction to the book I'm writing at the moment called Profit Motives. Today, new strains of techno-colonialism are emerging, which are the latest of a series of echoes throughout Western history. An ascendant cabal of technology elites are attempting to reshape the world in favor whilst hiding in plain, plain sight behind the faceless technologies that have enriched them. Theirs is a Promethean zealotry without faith affecting an aura of design, divine sanction for purposes of elevating the ego, enriching the chosen ones, and creating empires of varying stripes. Was it not always so? History is littered with the examples of unintended consequences that are risked when the self-righteous set the agenda. 
profit motives, explores imbrications of capital, technology, and divinity, with attention paid to the reshaping of the world map by would-be empires and their messianic figureheads. All right, so more pictures of profits. We talk in Bitcoin, or the Bitcoiners talk about Bitcoin's immaculate misconception because Satoshi left without cashing out their coins. Um, and we see this kind of weird power vacuum in these decentralized networks where people step in to fill the roles of the leaders. Let's talk about the, and like, well, the prophets. What's the point of the prophet? It's to lead us to the promised land. Where's the promised land? Well, we've got to make it, because it's, that's how it is now. So let's talk about governance futures uh, you know, for the last few minutes. So network states. I suppose you've probably mostly heard about this, but I will just recap uh, some words by one Dr. Srinivasan. A network state is a social network with a moral innovation, a sense of national consciousness, a recognized founder, a capacity for collective action, an in-person level of civility, an integrated cryptocurrency, a consensual government limited by a social smart contract, an archipelago of crowdfunded physical territories, a virtual capital, and an on-chain census that proves a large enough population, income, and real estate footprint to attain a measure of diplomatic recognition. Well. It's not something that new. Like the technology architecture and the possibilities for doing this at a distributed scale is new. Uh, but I would argue that we're seeing echoes through history here. And so uh, many people have shown up in different parts of the world, declared themselves absolute rulers, kings, emperors, gods, and then proceeded to start selling stocks, shares, commodities uh, back in their homelands. So um, you might want to look at the kingdom of Patagonia, the kingdom of Poyais, which are both in South America, for example. And yet, people love to print their own money. I think we all know that by now. Um, here's a mock-up of Lieberland's uh, Metaverse Capital by, uh, designed by uh, Zaha Hadid Architects. So Lieberland is a bit of swamp between Serbia and Croatia, which neither country can occupy because it will trigger a war uh, according to the conditions of a peace treaty. And so one enterprising Bitcoiner put a flag in that swamp, and that's what he calls his home. He doesn't actually live there, but that's where Lieberland is. Anyway, you've probably seen some of these things, Satoshi Island, Crypto Land, MSC Satoshi, Bitcoin City, El Salvador, uh, Praxis, Aleph, Erbit, and so on. So I see these all as very invocations of this like new frontierism, new colonialism that's being made possible by the technologies uh, that we're discussing today. Here's a real poster slide from a Bitcoin conference in 2019 in Malta, where the Bitcoiners dressed themselves up as Knights Templars and Knights Hospitallers, which were the Crusader orders that were created in the wake of the 11th century call to retake the Holy Land in the name of Christendom. So I would argue that there is a resonance between what happened a thousand years ago in the Levant and what is happening today with network states. I don't have much time to discuss it. You'll just have to read my book about that. Okay. So the network state, today's tech overlords are the descendants of Europe's Crusaders well-financed, zealous fanatics, wreaking destruction on the planetary other in the name of their greater good. The Vatican-sponsored waves of Levantine invasions that began in the late 11th century were the midwife of capitalism, colonialism, and technology as we know it today. From, the, from Pope Urban II and King Baldwin I of Jerusalem to Christopher Columbus, Dwight Eisenhower, and George W. Bush, the notion of the crusade as a righteous civilizational war will endure as long as capitalism is able to proliferate unfettered, corrupting everything we hold dear with its logic of scarcity and competition. With the network state concept, a cadre of powerful ideologues blessed with tokenized wealth are toying with the prospect of reshaping national frontiers, mirroring the desires of Frankish noblemen and their knightly orders in the Levant a thousand years ago. And so here's a little schematic where I've tried to make sense of the ways that aligned communities can become city-states, network states, and even nation-states, reified through the action of capital, legitimacy, and uh, territorialization. And I'm just going to, like, we're getting towards the end of the talk now, I'm just going to put up a map of the kingdoms that the Crusaders made in the Levant in the wake of the First Crusade, and uh, just like so you know that they actually did this thing. And so if we talk about the network state in a hypoth hypothetical sense, that's fine, but we can ask ourselves what comes after it, and we have a thousand years of history to look at. So I would ask you to look at that. And so in conclusion, Please remember the socio in the socio-technical systems that we are designing, conceiving, developing, and implementing. Please think before you build. Please build responsibly. Ask yourself what you are trying to decentralize. And I'm begging you, well, not you, the people that like network states, please read a history book. Be please. Uh, no more crusades.
So I'm going to say uh, thanks to the Zero Exelon team and community, MIT Computational Law Report, Folklore Zero X, Trust, Giza Tech, Max Haven and Pluto Press, Patti Davila, and Louise Lorenz. No thanks to overgovernance maxis, chain mail gazers, escargo cultists, nightwork statists, petro masculinists, capitalist zealists, and coders law enjo enjoyers. I'll leave you with, on the left of the screen, an example of overgovernance. This is at the workspace called Trust, where I'm based, where uh, it was proposed that we use quadratic voting to decide what kind of toilet paper we have in the, back in the bathrooms. Don't be like them. Okay, thank you very much.